Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President and I are pl very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis, and the incoming President, Ms. Lagarde. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We expect them to remain at their present or lower levels until we have seen the inflation outlook robustly converge to a level sufficiently close to, but below 2% within our projection horizon. And such convergence being consistently reflected in underlying inflation dynamics. As decided at our last meeting in September, we will restart net purchases under our asset purchase program at a monthly pace of 20 billion euro as from November 1st. We expect them to run for as long as necessary to reinforce the accommodative impact of our policy rates and to end shortly before we start raising the key ECB interest rates. We also intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case, for as long as necessary, to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. The Governing Council reiterated the need for a highly accommodative stance of monetary policy for, for a prolonged period of time to support underlying inflation pressures and headline inflation developments over the medium term. In particular, the Governing Council's forward guidance will ensure that financial conditions adjust in accordance with changes to the inflation outlook. In any case, the Governing Council continues to stand ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation moves towards its aim in a sustained manner in line with its commitment to symmetry. The incoming data since the last Governing Council meeting in early September confirm our previous assessment of a protracted weakness in the euro area growth dynamics the persistence of prominent downside risks and muted inflation pressures. At the same time, ongoing employment growth and increasing wages continue to underpin the resilience of the euro area economy. The comprehensive package of policy measures that we decided at our last meeting provides substantial monetary stimulus, which will contribute to a further easing in borrowing conditions for firms and households. This will support the euro area expansion, the ongoing build-up of domestic price pressures, and thus the sustained convergence of inflation to our medium-term inflation aim. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP growth was confirmed at 0.2% quarter on quarter in the second quarter of 2019, following a rise of 0.4% in the previous quarter. Incoming economic data and survey information continue to point to moderate but positive growth in the second half of this year. This slowdown in growth mainly reflects the ongoing weakness of international trade in an environment of persistent global uncertainties, which continue to weigh on the euro area manufacturing sector and are dampening the investment growth. At the same time, the services and construction sectors remain resilient, despite some moderation. The euro area expansion is supported by favorable financing conditions, further employment gains in conjunction with rising wages, the mildly expansionary euro area fiscal stance, 
and the ongoing, albeit somewhat slower, growth in global activity. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook remain on the downside. In particular, these risks pertain to the prolonged presence of uncertainties related to geopolitical factors, rising protectionism, and vulnerabilities in emerging markets. Euro area annual HICP inflation decreased from 1% in August 2019 to 0.8% in September, reflecting lower food and energy price inflation. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, headline inflation is likely to decline slightly further before rising again at the end of the year. Measures of underlying inflation remained generally muted, and indicators of inflation expectations stand at low levels. While labor cost pressures have strengthened amid tighter labor markets, the weaker growth momentum is delaying their pass through to inflation. Over the medium term, inflation is expected to increase, supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and robust wage growth. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3 growth increased to 5.7% in August 2019 after 5.1% in July. Sustained rates of broad money growth reflect ongoing bank credit creation for the private sector and low opportunity costs of holding M3. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 continues to be the main contributor to broad money growth on the components side. The growth of loans to firms and households remains solid benefiting from the continued pass-through of our accommodative monetary policy, of our accommodative monetary policy stance to bank lending rates. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations increased to 4.3% in August from 4% in July. While the annual growth rate of loans to households remained unchanged at 3.4% in August. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the third quarter of 2019 indicates a slight easing of credit standards and increasing demand for loans to our households, while demand for loans to firms remained broadly stable. Our accommodative monetary policy stance will help to safeguard favorable bank lending conditions and will continue to support access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to rip the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer-term growth potential, supporting aggregate demand at the current juncture, and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural policies in euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to boost euro area productivity and growth potential, reduce structural unemployment, and increase resilience. The 2019 country-specific recommendations should serve as the relevant signpost. Regarding fiscal policies, the mildly expansionary euro area fiscal stance is currently providing some support to economic activity. In view of the weakening economic outlook and the continued prominence of downside risks, governments with fiscal space should act in an effective and timely manner. In countries where public debt is high, governments need to pursue prudent policies 
and meet structural balance targets, which will create the conditions for automatic stabilizers to operate freely. All countries should intensify their efforts to achieve a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. Likewise, the transparent and consistent implementation of the European Union's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the functioning of economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council welcomes the ongoing work and urges further specific and decisive steps to complete the banking union and the capital markets union. And now we are at your disposal for questions. Mr. Weisberg. with CNBC. I have two questions. Um, the IMF just um, at their last meeting raised concerns about the effects of low interest rates on the financial system. So my first question would be, uh, what makes you so confident that more of negative rates and quantitative easing or asset purchase program is doing more, uh, is doing more good than harm? And my second question would be on uh, your legacy and whether you feel it's being tarnished by the recent discussion, which were unusually public, um, about the rift in the governing council and the disagreement about the policy action taken. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, um, well, the IMF didn't say that the negative rates are ineffective. The, as a matter of fact, the overall assessment of uh, negative rates uh, is, is generally positive. For us, it's very positive. It's been a very positive experience. Negative rates have stimulated the economy, have affected positively employment, and, uh, and so all in all, we're exactly in the direction we, we wanted them to be. Uh, but the IMF also raised concerns about potential side effects of negative rates for very negative for a long time. The discussion is really didn't go into too much detail, but we are also aware of that, and we are monitoring these risks. I should say that so far, first of all, we should distinguish different categories, banks, insurance companies, pension funds, and other intermediaries. Uh, the overall assessment has been clearly positive. In other words, the improvements in the economy have more than offset negative side effects from, uh, from low rates. Uh, but it's the, the fact that we are monitoring constantly this uh, uh, is shown by our decision in early September of introducing a tiering system, which uh, basically partly compensates the banks from, this, uh, from the negative rates. Um, now, your second question, frankly, the answer is no. And uh, <laughs> I... We, we, I mean, we, we, have, we have discussions, everybody has discussions, all jurisdictions uh, have disagreements when monetary policy decisions um, come to be discussed. And these disagreements are often made public, often they are not. So um, I think it's, it's not been the first time. Uh, so I, I've taken this as, uh, as part and parcel of the ongoing debate and discussions. Thank you. Ms. Bufaki? Isabella Bufaki from Sole 24 Ore. I have two questions, Mr. President. The first one is about the fact that the Governing Council tasked the relevant Euro system committees with examining options for the size and composition of potential new net asset purchases. Take into account eventual committee's options, and even if the Governing Council did not discuss this topic, um, given that the markets give the APP and uh, firepower uh, crucial, um, what is uh, your opinion on the options that could be considered uh, in enlarging the APP? And my second question is uh, looking forward. Um, what do you see are the main risks um, from your risk rider for, uh, f that you can foresee for the European economy and for the financial markets? In other words, 
what should we all worry about the most on the short term and long term horizon? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, since you're going back to the issue of, uh, of voting and committees, let me just give you a few highlights. First of all, um, and I will, um, I will um, read sentences from the public account, the account you've seen. So first, all members agreed that the further easing of monetary policy stance was warranted. Okay. Then we had an open discussion about the choice of instruments best suited to address current challenges. So, and we give account of these discussions. Then we start going bit by bit, saying what sort of majority was by for each part of the discussion. And we say a clear majority of governing council members supported the broad package of measures that was ultimately decided upon in September. A large majority of members agreed to change the modalities of the new series of Teltros. All members concurred with continued reinvestment. Members generally agreed with the proposal to enhance the state-based component of the Governing Council for our guidance on interest rates. A clear majority of members agreed with the proposal to restart net purchases under the asset purchase program with the modalities that I've just uh, explained. And a very large majority of members agreed with the proposal to lower the rate on the deposit facility by 10 basis points. Finally, a majority of members went along with the proposed introduction of the two-tier system for reserve remuneration. And this comes straight from the public account that you've seen. So no surprise that today, basically, the uh, proposal of the chief economist, namely to maintain the monetary policy stance uh, went basically through approved a unanimity. So there was no, so it's not surprising given these majorities. Now coming to your point about the committees, um, let me again go back to the uh, IES in July, where we, were, we tasked the committees with examining options including ways to reinforce our forward guidance on policy rates, mitigating measures such as the design of a tiered system for reserve remuneration, and options for the size and composition of potential new asset purchases. This is the introductory statement in July. So, and then the, we, we have already gone through this on, a, on other occasions, but for the function of the committee is, is to provide technical advice to the governing council, and that's what they did. And then the Governing Council, of course, decides as it uh, deems appropriate. It's not the first time that uh, the Governing Council has a different mind, it's happened many other times, so no surprises there. And it's all, in a sense, confirmed by the maintaining the monetary policy stance today. What are the main risks? Well, the main risk for, from all viewpoints, but especially also from a financial stability viewpoint, is a downturn in the economy. And, uh, and it's the, whether it's global or it's Eurozone, but that's, I think, would, see, would be the main risk from all viewpoints, from, uh, from, the, from the side of convergence of inflation to our objective, obviously from the angle of maintaining a high level of employment and of economic activity and of a, of a nominal wage growth as we are seeing today, and from the angle of financial stability itself. Because clearly, one of the great benefits that are uh, that the uh, banking sector, and actually all, all players in the financial system had from this accommodative monetary policy, was the uh, extraordinary improvement in the quality of their credit, of their assets more generally, which comes with the recovery which basically affect, affected positively the, um, the profitability of the banking system. So, thank you. Mr. Korani. Thank you very much, uh, Balash Korani from Reuters. Did Christine Lagarde take part in the discussion? Did she express views on monetary policy and was she in full agreement with uh, the, the ECB's policy stance? 
Second question is about what's been happening on the market since your September meeting. Uh, interest rates have gone up, uh, market-based inflation expectations have gone down. Uh, are you worried about this? Is the market misreading uh, your, your, your policy, or are you comfortable with, uh, with uh, what the markets are pricing in? Thank you. Uh, no, Christine Lagarde didn't take part to the discussions, uh, and, but she was there. And uh, without taking part to discussions or the deliberations, on your second question, um, no, I don't think the the, the uh, basically well. Let's ask ourselves what was the main goal of the September monetary policy decisions? Was to cement the accommodative monetary policy stance that was embedded in the expectations as they had been affected by the weakening, regularly, continuously weakening medium-term outlook. And, uh, and the governing council today in the discussion felt that this has been largely, very largely achieved. In other words, we saw the flattening of the yield curve. Uh, we saw uh, the complete, now complete transmission of uh, uh, a lower DFR, deposit facility rate, into lower short-term rates. So what we have observed there, it's partly due to the fact that there may be a part of these expectations which was not warranted by the weakening economic outlook, which went, in a sense, beyond the economic developments, which might have been disappointed. But it's a, it's a very small part. But the second and probably more important reason for the developments we've seen is the uh, overall uncertainty. In one way, in a sense, one has the sense that somehow uh, the, the lower likelihood of a hard Brexit or a cliff edge has improved the overall situation. On the other, the uncertainty is still there. And by the way, on this specific point, it's true that uh, it's improved uh, the, in the short term. The, um, the, the, the likelihood of having a cliff edge has gone down. At the same time, the medium-term uncertainty is considered with concern. So, and, at the same, and the rest of the geopolitical uncertainty has continued to affect markets. So I would read the, uh, the market developments in this way. I think actually, uh, I don't think the market misread. Actually, the market showed that they understood perfectly well our reaction function. Thank you. Ms. Laird. Thank you. Mr. Draghi, the Bundesbank has recently said that they see a chance of a German recession this year. Given the discord on the council, which you discussed earlier, does that eliminate or narrow your policy options where, I know you set rates for the whole of the Eurozone, but Germany as the biggest economy can't be ignored. Second question, is we've I'm sorry, what's the question? What policy, given, given the discord um, amongst policy oh, members, governing okay. council members, do you feel that you have the same number of options should Germany pull other countries into some kind of a downturn? The second question is, um, given that central bankers have become less popular with their governments, and I'm thinking in the US as well, We've talked over the years about the G20 cooperation on f linking together monetary policy, fiscal co policy, inter-country inter inter and intra-country. Given what's happening in the US, given the difficulties that central bankers are having with their own governments, can that cooperation be duplicated if there's another global downturn? Um. Now, your first question, if any, I mean, let me say this. Unfortunately, uh, everything that's happened in September since our monetary policy decisions uh, has shown abundantly that, uh, our, uh, that the governing council's determination to act in a substantive manner was justified. Uh, we had uh, all kinds of survey indicators, and now uh, also uh, some, some, few, but some, data uh, showing, a con showing a further weakening of the economy. Uh, just one number that I remember is the PMI 
in manufacturing is now at the lowest level since 2012. And uh, another, point, uh, another point of observation that, uh, that, uh, that I would say uh, we, but everybody uses to assess the resilience of the economy is to, uh, is, is to, what ex is to, see, to look at what extent the weakness in the manufacturing sector is actually spreading to the service sector. And until a month and a half, two months ago, we could say the service sector is, was fully resilient. And now we've seen the PMI in services also declining sharply in, uh, in uh, I think it was September reading. So, and then we have many other indices pointing into that direction. Uh, now, regardless of the German, of the development in the German economy, I think that the decisions taken in September uh, fully justify the continuation of an accommodative monetary policy stance and, uh, and the maintaining of uh, favorable financing conditions for, for the, for the non-financial corporations, companies, and the small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, the second point, uh, it, it's, it's quite clear that central banks ought to continue to cooperate. Uh, no matter what happens in other parts of our institutional system, uh, cooperation of uh, central banks within their mandate, within their mandate, is essential. And the fora like G20 or other multilateral fora are more important, more essential than ever. Thank you. Mr. Yakish? Klaus Anna Jakisch, ARD German Television. Mr. President, please allow me to rather personal questions on this particular day. Um, your colleague Peter Pratt once told me that by the time he and you are leaving, you both would prefer to have monetary policy back to a kind of normality. We know that this unfortunately hasn't happened. Uh, can you give us some insight how do you feel about it and whether you perhaps also feel that politicians could have helped you a little bit more? And the second question, please. Um, we have read now in the, in the last weeks a lot uh, of reviews of your term in office and a lot of speculation. But I think what population would like to know is how you actually feel about this uh, term. Thank you very much and Thank all the you. best. Thank you. Thank you for your wishes. Um, I think I, it's just one question, really. And um, uh, also, well, first of all, let me, let me just refer to Peter Pratt's words. Uh, it is true. Yes, so much so that uh, during 2017, 2017, we gradually changed our monetary policy stance and we were preparing to exit, uh, exit uh, that uh, stance of monetary policy. But then conditions changed. And what uh, prevails under everything else is the determination to pursue the mandate for which this institution was created and uh, we work for it. And therefore, we had to change course and get back into, into the present stance. Let me also add one thing, that uh, if there is one take from the recent IMF meetings, is that uh, the, what, the paradigm of reference, the um, paradigm of reference has changed. Until not long ago, uh, the, the, the IMF and all the um, observers would say that, yes, interest rates are low, and they may stay low for some time, but then they will go up. Now, the sense of many discussions at the IMF is actually that they will stay low for a long time. They will stay low for a long time because the real rate of interest has also declined. And this implies that the exit from unconventional monetary policies is shifted in time, shifted forward in time. So, the way I feel, I feel, I feel like someone who tried to comply with the mandate uh, the best possible way. Thank you. Mr. Arnold? A couple of similar questions uh, in the same kind of vein. Um, first question is, what's your biggest regret, um, Mario? And the second one is, what advice are you giving to Christine Lagarde? Uh, 
you can tell us about anyway? Well, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer either question. <laughs> but uh, I, saying that uh, I, I always focus on things that can be done, not things that you can't change. And you can't change the past unless you are a historian. But, uh, but, uh, and you, uh, so I, I focus on what's been, what's been done and assessed by facts. And, and here, um, well, uh, the second question I'll answer immediately, N no advice is needed. She knows perfectly well what, uh, what she has to do. And by the way, she has a long period of time ahead during which she will have to form her own view together with the governing council about what to do. But the, I stop here, really, <laughs> that, because this question is going to pop up again and again. What, what are, whether, what, what's, how do you judge the past? So if nobody's asking this question, I'll come back to you later. Mr. Malin. Jan Malin, Handelsblatt. Um, Mr. Draghi, I have a question on the issuer limit. Many people think that the limit will be reached uh, quite soon w with the new purchases, especially for Germany. Philip Lane recently said, according to the ECB's calculations, this may not uh, become a problem for an extended period of time. Um, could you maybe explain why the ECB's calculations are more optimistic than other calculations? And my second question uh, is on uh, Germany. In Germany, there's a more open discussion about the so-called debt break, which restricts uh, the f federal government deficit to no more than 0.35% uh, um, of GDP, unless there's a, a, a downturn hits. Do you think such a rule makes economic sense? Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. that, and uh, thank you for all the other questions over the last eight years. Thank you. Um, thank you. First, let me respond to the first question. Uh, yeah, that was raised because it's open-ended, and so naturally people ask, uh, uh, how, when are you going to bump into these limits, and then what happens? Uh, the answer is, Philip Lane is right. Uh, it's going to take uh, quite a bit of time before this issue will realistically present itself as a problem. And the, but all estimates, by the way, have to assume something about the issuance of bonds. And, uh, and clearly there you make certain assumptions about what fiscal policy is going to be. Under reasonable assumptions, not extreme either way, there is enough time. I, frankly, that what I think as I said in the last press conference, I don't see this problem ca coming up again anytime soon. So um, that's, the, that's the answer. Different calculations may reflect different assumptions about issuance. Uh, but uh, so that's one, one, one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that uh, clearly these, uh, these limits um, and I've said this again many times, uh, these limits are specific, first of all, are self-imposed, and second, are specific to the contingency in which they were originally stated. This, uh, so the ECJ has granted ample discretionary power within the mandate to the ECB. I think that is, uh, finally, finally, there is one, third, one other part to my answer. Um, we have, we have capital key rules in the way we purchase bonds. And the relevant key is the stock of capital. So, it, uh, so even though we may observe deviations in terms of flows, it's the stock that we have to look at. And there, frankly, we don't foresee uh, substantial material deviations in the aggregate in the, in the months and years to come. Um, now, your second question, I'm afraid I can't answer. I would never dare to judge fiscal policies in one specific country. Thank you. And thank you very much for your kind words before. Thank you. Mr. Stumpf.
Hi, I'm Joseph Stum from Expansion. Uh, you have been asked uh, about something that you regret with no answer. Maybe you could tell us one thing that you are proud of. And another same, question. Same I would like to go back to your famous London speech. Uh, after all, did the Euro bumblebee, as you call it then, uh, graduated into a real bee? Well, I think uh, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, about the first question, I have the same answer. Uh, there isn't any specific, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually, uh, if, if there is one general thing I'm proud of is the, the way in which the governing council and myself have constantly pursued our mandate. Uh, this is something uh, we collectively should be very, very proud. And um, uh, in a sense, now we can talk about legacy and all this later, but in a sense, this is part of our legacy. Never give up. Um, now, the second question is about the bumblebee. Now, that uh, I should say, now I can't really answer this question because I was immediately, um, well, there was someone of great authority who said immediately that this was dubious biology. <laughs> and so I would, I would not really <laughs> develop this concept any further. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lacour? Uh, Jean-Philippe Lacour from Agence France Presse. Um, after the former meeting in September, uh, the governors Weidmann and Knot expressed very publicly how they felt uh, with the decisions. And what was you, your reaction, or did you contact them to say, stop this cacophony, please? Or did, did, <laughs> was it your, your duty then as president of ECB to, to, to bring kind of in, in, the, in this uh, governing council back. So maybe you can say to what was the, the flavor to today of the, the, during the meeting. When, uh, and the second question regarding maybe your f future. Um, the, the question was asked to your predecessor what you will do uh, after being uh, uh, ECB president. Mr. Trichet said I have uh, four grandchildren uh, and want to take more care about them and I want to read uh, some poetry. So <laughs> can you tell maybe, do we want to share with us what you will do in the next future? Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, there was no reaction on my side. Um, so uh, there was no reaction at all. And, uh, and today, as I said before, the discussion was basically uh, supportive uh, about the uh, chief economist, about Philip Lane's proposal, of the Philip Lane's proposal. And uh, as a matter of fact, some of, the, uh, some of the dissenters, one of the dissenters called for uh, unity and uh, implementation, full implementation of the policy package. Another dissent has said, bygones are bygones. So uh, one, one thing you can get out of this meeting, besides the various uh, substantive issues being discussed, was a general sense that a general call to unity. On, uh, on the next, uh, on the next uh, uh, question, uh, I, as you know, I, uh, generally speaking, I don't have any uh, set idea about that, but if you want more information, just ask my wife. <laughs> she would know. Miss Ettler? I hope she does. <laughs> I hope so too. Anja Ettler from Welt and Welt am Sonntag. In March uh, 2012, you got a so-called uh, Prussian spiked helmet, a Pickelhaube. And uh, what do you plan to do with it now that Bild Zeitung has claimed it back today? Will you leave it here? Will you take it with you? And really, how glad are you to finally leaving Germany and all those fierce critics behind you? And is there maybe one last thing you want to tell them, especially here, but maybe also with you to those former ECB council members who recently published a very negative memorandum on uh, ECB policies? Thank you. Thank you. Well, on, on, the, on the gift I received uh, way back in 2012 in March, um, I think there is an old German saying that says, uh, geschenkt ist geschenkt. <laughs> so that is, uh, uh, I plan to keep it. Um, the, 
the other, the other issue, I, I think uh, uh, there is ultimately, it's really, it's the, it's the reality that speaks more strongly than any other voice. It's the reality together with the conviction uh, that uh, we uh, did what we did always in uh, pursuing our mandate. We never, uh, and if anything, that's a distinctive thing. Very often criti criticisms um, address issues that really are not pertinent with our mandate. And uh, we, stayed, we stayed firmly on, on this course, on, uh, on pursuing our mandate. And uh, that's what the only thing I, I feel like saying today. Thank you. Mr. Fellas. Thank you, Tom Fellas from the Wall Street Journal. Um, just to follow up on this comment about the helmet that you're keeping. Oh, yes. Um, do, you, do you think that, um, uh, I mean, clearly you, you do have a number of critics in Germany. Do you think you could have uh, spent really? longer <laughs> <laughs> trying to, um, to uh, address those criticisms in Germany? Um, is that something that perhaps uh, Christine Lagarde could, could uh, prioritize, should prioritize? Um, and a second, second question was about um, uh, the, I suppose, the political pressure on central banks and also um, inversely the way that the ECB seems to be also putting pressure on, on governments. Um, I mean, does this suggest that in future there should be closer ties between governments and uh, central banks or the, or the ECB? Should it become more of a political actor given that it's uh, the Eurozone's main federal institution? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, the first question is the, about the political pressure, or? Address criticism in Germany, should Christine Lagarde? I'm sorry, the? Address criticism in Germany, no. Should Christine Lagarde do that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Do, no, I don't, uh, that's why I don't remember the question, because I have no answer to that. <laughs> so it's, uh, no, I have no advice uh, to, to, for Christine. She knows, as I said, she knows better than anybody else what to do and what to say. Uh, and uh, now on the second point, is there political pressure on central banks? True, you can actually see um, um, more political pressure in the last year than, um, than in many years before. And, uh, but is it, uh, is it also, is it, is it equally true for the ECB? Much less so, frankly. We, we had, I had occasional exchanges uh, with this or that finance minister uh, but uh, it never became anything comparable that you see in other, in other countries today. Um, so that's, that's now, uh, should, what's the relationship between ECB and governments? Now, it, especially at this time, uh, in this instance, this question is quite important because, as I, I said last time, I repeat it today, monetary policy will continue to do its job. So don't think that monetary policy just relaxes and stops working. But it's quite clear that with fiscal policy, the objectives of monetary policy will be reached sooner and with less side effects. And, and the reason lies mostly in what I said before, being the, the real rate, the natural rate of interest declining, that's where the space for fiscal policy comes, comes in. Uh, so if one wants to see higher rates sooner, uh, fiscal policy should be, should be active. Although probably monetary policy will continue to be accommodative, even if fiscal policy will become more expansionary in the early stages of this expansion at least. So given that that's the situation, that's probably gonna stay like this for some time uh, in the future. Uh, what is the relationship? I, I, in, in some of the speeches I gave, I spoke about, uh, yes, central banks are independent, but they are independent in an interdependent world. So to the extent that fiscal policy, act, that an active fiscal policy, doesn't prejudge the objective of price stability, there is no contradiction, there is no threat to the monetary dominance of the, of the central bank. Thank you. Mr. Hyten. Luke Hyten, Market News. Um, Mr. Draghi, my first question was on uh, fiscal policy again, I'm afraid. Um, 
How confident are you that your pleas for um, greater fiscal policy action are actually being listened to and will be acted upon in a timely fashion uh, in Europe's capitals? And do you have an idea of how much stimulus would be needed in the next couple of years in order to meet the ECB's inflation objective? Um, and then secondly, with the UK, Japan and the US all doing uh, their own QE programs in a public reverse auction format, um, and financial markets best practices moving to a greater level of transparency, why does the ECB continue doing its PSPP program in a primarily opaque fashion with minimal transparency? Well, the, um, the answer to the second question was uh, part of the design when the, P the PSPP and the, uh, was, uh, was introduced uh, years ago. And at that time, it was deemed that um, to follow the other channel, the, the reverse auction system, would not be uh, proper, would not be suitable in this present situation in Europe, in the Eurozone. So it's a matter of there isn't any special policy reason, but it was much, very much a matter of uh, technical convenience. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the first question, I don't want to make anticipations on whether fiscal policies will react uh, sooner. Also because the issue is far from being simple. Uh, we know, we say, we said in the introductory statement that the countries with fiscal space should act and countries without fiscal space should create the conditions for their automatic stabilizers to operate freely. Now, would that be, what, what does it mean exactly? Would there be stimulus which spills over outside the countries that actually, that actually undertake fiscal policy if, if they do so? How much of this would go into the countries that need this? And this is very much intertwined with the progress that the, the EMU, the Economic and Monetary Union, Union will make on designing a central fiscal capacity with genuine capacity to stabilize the economy over the cycle, which doesn't exist yet. So it's, uh, it's far from being uh, a discussion like uh, you might have in a one country jurisdiction where the issue is whether expand the deficit today or not. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it has to do with governance of the, of the institution. By the way, the previous question I had about the debt break uh, was asked about uh, whether it makes sense. You asked me that. It's part of the same questions, really. Uh, in, in, in this part of the world, to have an active fiscal policy uh, of the size that might be required. By the way, the present fiscal stance is mildly expansionary. But if uh, a broader fiscal action were to be required, it's the governance issues which are the most important ones. Thank you. Ms. Pira? I had a lot of questions, but they were made. Okay. Uh, it's Mariangela Pira from Sky TG24. Nice to meet you in person. Um, my question is, um, I've heard a lot about you talking to economists. We journalists define you as Super Mario. But um, my question is, what are you taking with you, not as Super Mario, but uh, as Mario Draghi, a person who had a very important job? What are you taking with you uh, with this experience as a president of the ECB? And uh, on a more personal note, uh, my friends tell him that um, Following uh, monetary policy is boring, but uh, with your presidency, it wasn't boring at all. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the compliments. That's uh, one of the most important things that all should attempt to be not boring. But, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean, the other question is really, um, is really uh, very deep and uh, not easy to answer. Uh, certainly, this experience has been uh, very intense, profound, and fascinating. And I, I take this with me. Then, uh, how much of this will get into personal reflections is too early to say. So, thank you. Ms. Mastroboni. Thank you, Mr. Draghi. Tonia Mastroboni, La Repubblica. Uh, I will try again the 
the question about the future, because one year ago I asked Christine Lagarde what she would do after the IMF, and she told me I will be grandmother. It didn't exactly go like this. So, so I would like to ask you if you would exclude any political rule in the future, for example. Uh, there is much, uh, of course, uh, discussion in Italy about you coming back as the president of the republic in two years, or maybe any any political role. And the second question is, um, Germany appointed a new member of the board now, it's Isabel Schnabel, and uh, there are rumors about the fact that Germany, the govern government m might have understood that uh, it's it's weakness to have lost so many members of the IC, of the of the ECB in these years. How do you view the fact that in the last, I think, 10 years, Germany has uh, three German members of the of the board have, have stepped down? Is it weakness? Is it strength? Is it something that that signalizes an anomaly in the ECB? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, but your first question is, I have no, I mean, just I don't know. I said this many times. And for much of what, much part of what I'm going to do next, as I said before, just ask my wife. Uh, she'll know better, I think. Um, on the, um, the second question, Isabel is an excellent economist. And she will do very well. She has all the capacities to do very, very well. Enhance the discussions uh, outside, inside the ECB, actively participate into the work of the ECB. So we should uh, we should welcome her appointment very warmly. Thank you. Is annunciata. Hello, I'm Francesca Nava, Italian Public Television, Rai 3. I, uh, um, I had some, some questions, but they have already been done. Um, a recent survey uh, by uh, the Bank of America reveals that uh, uh, impotence and ineffectiveness of uh, central banks, including European central banks, are uh, the second risk perceived by investors. My question is, um, do you think that uh, these investor concerns are justified? And in other words, is there a risk of financial uh, bubble? Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you, thank you. But I'm sorry, you asked whether the expansionary monetary policies of central banks is the second largest risk. Yes. I, I can answer for the Eurozone. In the Eurozone, and that's a question we ask ourselves every day, many times a day, and, the, and we monitor, I'm saying this because we monitor the market developments very closely. And we see some segments of financial markets where valuations are overstretched. One case is real estate, for example, and especially prime commercial real estate. Um, now, the causes of these uh, overstretched valuations often uh, don't lead directly to our monetary policies. For prime commercial real estate is the action of international investors that are investing heavily in that. For real estate, certainly the low interest rates are important. However, if when we go and look at how the mortgage market is actually behaving, in other words, there has been a spike in mortgage lending, we don't see that. We see some mortgage, some increase in mortgage lending in the new mortgages. But overall, if you take the aggregate figures, still they, they really show a solid expansion, but nothing Nothing um, uh, in, in, so we may have other, other sex, but frankly, all, all in all, we don't see bubbles. And uh, when we see some bubbles, they are local bubbles that should be, for example, some segments of the bond market, the, uh, the um, high yield leveraged uh, bond market, which by the way, it's not a big issue in Europe, it's more of a big issue in other, in other jurisdictions, but we have to make sure that our banks don't invest into this market as they used to do before the financial crisis where they bought lots of stuff that then didn't perform well. So uh, for that, the remedies, the answers for many of these sort of potential local bubbles are macroprudential policies, supervisory policies. And, uh, and certainly, the other important issue is that much of this uh, danger, much of this risk, uh, much of this search for yields uh, happens in the non-banking sector, and more specifically, in the uh, so-called shadow banking sector. And unfortunately there, 
the perimeter of macroprudential policies does not include that sector. So we have some visibility, pretty good visibility, in what hap into what happens in the banking sector, which, by the way, still is about 80% of credit intermediation in this part of the world. But uh, we don't have much visibility for the rest of the financial sector. I mean, I'm talking for, for the non banks or for the shadow banking sector. Mr. Ewing? Um, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for your candor and um, uh, composure over the years and patience with all of our questions. Um, so, a couple I'll of last questions. That in a moment. So I just, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. When, when you started this job, uh, you know, Greece was at the center of a debt crisis, yes. completely frozen out of the debt market. Uh, there was a big restructuring. And then a couple of weeks ago, Greece sold uh, short term debt at a negative yield. Um, do you see that as a success or a risk? And uh, then, second question. If there's one thing you could fix about the way that the Eurozone functions, uh, what would that be? Thank you. Yeah. Well, the first question is, uh, is a, a clearly a success. And it's a success of, uh, first and foremost, of Greece, of the policies that the Greek governments have undertaken uh, in, uh, in, uh, in um, together with the Eurozone Solidarity and uh, under the advice of the IMF, the SM, and, the, uh, and to, for the limited extent, the ECB, for the, uh, as far as the banking and financial sector is concerned, the ECB as well. But the main efforts being done by, by the governments and by the Greek citizens that uh, certainly had to pay a, a, a very, very high price, a terrible price, as a matter of fact, especially in the early stages, of um, a debt deficit uh, financing, debt deficit finance bubble. Um, so this is a success. It's also, in a sense, a risk if these policies are not continued. And, but we, we see all the developments there uh, in, in Greece basically um, targeted to continue these policies. So it, it's, a, it's a good time for Greece now. And it's frankly, if you compare with the three, four years ago, it's a good time for Europe, for the Eurozone countries. We often tend to be rightly anxious about, uh, uh, about our objectives when we consider them uh, now. But in fact, some historical perspective, especially when we judge uh, countries and governments, is, uh, is very important. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you had a second question about what to fix in the Eurozone. Right. Um, sorry. Uh, there, uh, there is one thing that all the successful monetary unions have, and that's a central fiscal capacity. Um, a, in other words, whether this should be a, a budget or should be a system of insurance and the, so it's very important to have something of that nature, of an adequate size, something that can be used counter-cyclically, something that uh, basically would take care of the fact that national fiscal policies have, in my view, limited spillovers on the rest of the Eurozone. So one, one needs to have a central fiscal capacity and uh, of course, this should be designed in a way that doesn't create moral hazard. I think that's the main, uh, that's one of the main reasons of, for, for, for the slow progress on, on that front, is the, is, the, is the risk that the mechanisms would, uh, would be used uh, for increasing moral hazard. So the design of the rules is very important. Um, I think that's the that's I think the main thing. Mr. Taino. Danilo Taino, Corriere della Sera. Uh, the question is about the quality of the ECB staff. How important uh, has it been, 
And how important will it be for Mrs. Lagarde, who doesn't have experience as a central banker? Oh, believe me, uh, it's been important for me a lot. So even though I've been uh, central bank governor before, for six years uh, I had the privilege of sitting in the, in the governing council under the presidency of Mr. Trichet. Uh, the, the quality of our deliberations is so much, owes so much to the quality of the work of the staff. Uh, so it's, uh, it's important and it's, uh, it's been, a, I think that's the, in my view, that's the main ingredient of everything we've done and uh, everything we've done and it's the main ingredient in, uh, in the success of the ECB in its uh, being a credible central bank and it's, um, and it's a main ingredient in the big changes that the ECB had in the past. So I think uh, we ought to be very, very grateful to our outstanding staff. And the final question to Jana Rundle. Jana Rande with Bloomberg. Um, Mr. Draghi, you have been widely credited with saving the euro with three very simple words at a time when many people were betting, uh, for, uh, betting for a breakup. At the same time, the, ECB, the ECB's policies, your policies, are widely criticized across the region. And there is a risk that one day, one country might decide that the euro is not irreversible and will decide to leave. Have you paid too little attention uh, to reaching out to the public, to the people behind or beyond financial markets? And I have a second question for you, and I would like to read something to you. It's from a speech that um, Jörg Asmussen, a former executive board member, uh, gave in uh, late 2013. He said, Italy is too big to be rescued from the outside. It has to make the turnaround on its own. Its fate will critically determine the fate of the euro area. In this sense, the future of the euro area will not be decided in Paris or Berlin or in Frankfurt or in Brussels. It will be decided in Rome. What do you think of this statement and do you think that Italy will ever fix itself? Thank you. When, when, when was he saying that? It was in late 2013 in Milan, yeah. a speech in Milan. Exactly, he was absolutely right. And would you say the same thing today? I'm asking you. No, I mean, just of course not. Things have changed completely. And, uh, and frankly, everybody now in Italy said and stated that the euro is irreversible. And uh, so while there may have been sort of hypothetical doubts in one part of the, of the governance of the country, there aren't any more. So it's been accepted. Also, you see, the, it's, it's part of the normal Eurozone developments, the uh, pop popularity of the Euro. You said that the, 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 in, in your first question, the criticisms um, are across the region. Well, in a sense, they are across a region. But, uh, but, the, uh, but the, point, the point is that uh, at the same time, the popularity of the Euro has never been so high. So what's happening in Italy is actually where, where the euro popularity had gone up. Uh, it's also part of the general phenomenon. On the on your first question, uh, that's a, that's an important question. Of course, I mean I've tried to to do as much as one can be in here, uh, but I think uh, the, um, the more can be done, should be done, and one should never be tired of doing it. Uh, the, we, we here in a multi-country monetary union have a difficult, many things are better here than they are in other jurisdictions in one country monetary uh, jurisdiction, but there's one thing that's clearly more difficult, namely to reach to the public of 19 different countries. And it clearly here, central banks, national central banks are key for communication. And they can do, and they do, much more, in a sense, than a single president or board members can do because they, it's a constant communication. So in this sense, it's, uh, what, uh, it's very important what you said. There is one, one other aspect I would uh, just dwell a moment. 
the natural counterpart of central bankers are the ones who have to uh, implement the monetary policy decisions. And they are naturally the banks and the financial markets and other financial intermediaries. At the same time, the independence of a central bank is also based on the support that it enjoys. And, uh, and therefore, the, uh, what happened in communication by central banks over the last 10, 15 years uh, is a complete transformation. Nowadays, nobody would pride himself or herself of, uh, of saying, if you have understood me, you are stupid. Nobody would say that today. We all strive for transparency. And as you see, as you just thank you for having said that, for candor. So that has changed. Uh, but would we be naturally speaking to the large public? One has to be cautious about that. Because as soon as you change your audience, you change your language, and you naturally step into a different realm, the realm of politics. So yes to an open, broader communication, certainly, but it should be done with caution. Thank you. Now, um, now that it's finished, may I say something to you and uh, <laughs> say how thankful I've been to all of you in these eight years. Uh, it's been, um, I think it was actually, uh, it, it, it actually, it, it was originally an obligation. Then it became a welcome obligation, and then even a pleasure. Uh, so I should I should thank you, and it's uh, it's the thank the thank uh, the thanks are actually substantive, they are not uh, not formal only because of what I just said about communication. Communication has become a tool of monetary policy, so your uh, your interaction has been essential in our monetary policy decisions all throughout these these eight years. And, uh, and the other thing, frankly, is that you, with your mm, inquisitive questions, you have um, uh, stimulated the, the strive towards greater transparency and greater candor. Again, compare through the last 20, well, 20 years, communication in uh, central banks' communication, how it did change. And I think it did change uh, for, for a a great part because of your role. Uh, I don't think that by itself central bankers would have changed, by themselves central bankers would have changed communication uh, if left free to be opaque. So thank you for that. Thank you very much and uh, all the best to all of you.